Good evening, everyone. We're really thrilled to have you here today. Um, my name is Tracy Sulkin, and I am the Dean of the College of Media. And it's our great privilege to welcome you to a Frank Center event, a panel on elections and reporting in 2022. Um, we're really thrilled to have with us here today uh, Rich and Leslie Frank, um, who um, have made all this wonderful programming for our students possible. So thank you so much, uh, Rich and Leslie. And now I'd like to turn things over to uh, the inestimable uh, Colleen King, who's clinical assistant professor in our Department of Journalism and is the director of the Frank Center. Um, and she will introduce our panel. Colleen. Well, good evening, everyone, from the Spurlock Museum of World Cultures on the campus of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Tonight, reporting on politics and elections in 2022. It's being presented by the Richard and Leslie Frank Center for Leadership and Innovation in Media. It is indeed a great honor to introduce your panelists and your moderator tonight. Let's start with David Chalian, Vice President of Political Coverage and Political Director at CNN, who inside the industry happens to be known as one of the great people in the news business. He manages CNN's political coverage across the network's platforms, while also overseeing the polling and decision desks, which of course was no easy feat during this last presidential cycle. You can see him on air from morning until late at night, providing political analysis on television. In his spare time, he hosts the daily podcast, CNN Political Briefing. He's a veteran of ABC News, of Politico and PBS. His teams have won an Emmy Award and the Walter Cronkite Award for excellence in political television coverage. Fun fact, he double majored in theater and political science at Northwestern University. Up next, and I'm happy to say I know these next two panelists, starting with the instantly recognizable voice of Domenico Montanaro, senior political editor and correspondent for National Public Radio. In addition to providing analysis and editing on-air coverage, he is a regular voice on the influential NPR Politics podcast. He's a former high school English teacher who was previously political director over at the PBS NewsHour, deputy political director for us at NBC News, and a reporter at my local paper growing up, the Asbury Park Press. He's a University of Delaware graduate who received a master's in journalism from Columbia University in New York. Joining us from print media, Vivian Salama of the Wall Street Journal. She is the newspaper's national security reporter based in Washington, D.C. Vivian spent much of this year reporting from Ukraine after the Russian invasion. She recently got back home only to break news on the FBI search at Mar-a-Lago. Importantly, she's a former Baghdad bureau chief for the Associated Press. Vivian has reported from over 70 countries and literally had a front row seat in the White House briefing room as the correspondent covering the Trump administration. She has a law degree from Georgetown University, a master's in Islamic politics from Columbia University. She happens to be a New York native who, like many of us, got her start in local news. That brings us to the Illinois reporting world. Please welcome Chicago Tribune City Hall reporter Alice Yin. As part of the Metro Desk, she also covers Cook County government and the Obama Presidential Center. She arrived at the Tribune from the Associated Press, where she covered the Michigan State House. She's a native of the California Bay Area and graduated with degrees in journalism and economics from Northwestern. Which brings me to your moderator tonight. That would be Colleen King, director of the Frank Center for Leadership and Innovation in Media, a clinical assistant professor of journalism, and a former executive producer of The 11th Hour with Brian Williams. So please allow me this one point of personal privilege as the disjointed voice of Brian Williams. Colleen King is a dear friend, a fantastic co-worker, a veteran of the cable news wars who has, by my own calculation, produced more live television news than anyone in the state of Illinois or the entire American Midwest for that matter. Of course, I could be wrong, and if I am, she'll tell me. 
So, without further delay, there are your panelists and your moderator. I'll sign off and allow this great event to get underway. Um, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here, um, and wonderful to see all of you. Um, I would say here we are, 26 days uh, to go uh, before the midterms, and I think we have a um, a pretty sour mood in the country from the voters. Uh, those economic numbers, um, you know, the poll numbers are really bad. The, the the numbers that perhaps are worse are the inflation numbers that came out today uh, that show that those numbers that how Americans are sort of responding to the economy and what they're feeling are not likely to improve uh, given what we're learning about um, inflation, its continued presence uh, in people's daily lives. So uh, there is no doubt that there is a sour mood on the economy. What we have seen with the president's approval rating in our latest polls, a slight uptick from where President Biden was back in the beginning of the summer. That was sort of his low point. You know, history guides us that there's a very strong correlation between a president's approval rating and how his party does in the midterm election. But we've also learned in politics that history is not always such a good guide. So yes, that is sort of the historical pattern, um, but don't I, I would caution everyone to be over-reliant on that. No doubt if you're Joe Biden hitting the campaign trail as he is on a Western swing this week, he went to Colorado and California and Oregon. Um, to do so on the uptick instead of on the decline is good, but his numbers are in the range right now of presidents like Barack Obama, uh, Ronald Reagan, <clears throat> Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, all of whom saw big losses for their parties in their first midterm elections. Um, Domenico, NPR had a poll out with Maris last week on Congress and 45% of those polled said they'd vote for a Republican and 48 for a Democrat. Can you talk to us about how you're trying to oversee coverage across 50 states of worth of elections? Well, it's barely 50 states considering where the races are most competitive and where the races are that are gonna probably determine uh, control of the Senate in particular uh, and Congress more generally. But you know, our goal is to get as many voices on the air of people in the communities where they live for uh, to tell the stories that illuminate the big issues David was talking about. You know, inflation obviously continues to be the top concern uh, for voters, uh, although abortion rights has certainly increased Democratic enthusiasm almost to the point of where Republicans are, which to me indicates it's gonna be a pretty high turnout election this year, probably going to be record turnout for a midterm election. Uh, that uh, could mean, uh, could buoy Democrats in some of these Senate races along with what Mitch McConnell talks about and candidate quality. Some of the issues that Republican candidates have had certainly could uh, hamper their chances in a couple of places, especially with it being 50-50, Republicans needing to net a seat to be able to pick up control considering Democrats control the White House. But the House, still Republicans certainly have the advantage. You know, 48-45 on a congressional ballot test as we like to call it, is really not a good place to be for Democrats because historically they've needed a much wider margin on that question of someone saying, who would you vote for today if the elections were held today, a Democrat generic or Republican? And uh, you know, Democrats in recent years, when they've had success, have had like about a seven-point advantage or more. Um, so it, that makes it difficult, and that's because of how districts are drawn. Um, a whole host of reasons for that. Uh, in particular, also where some of these competitive districts are are sort of right-leaning districts, and also where people choose to live. A lot of Democrats live in cities and concentrated there, and it's really easy to draw circles around them uh, and make it 
you know, easier for Republicans to sort of pick away around the edges and control more legislatures. So right now you're looking at a likely Republican takeover of the House uh, and uh, more of a coin toss in the, in the Senate right now. Vivian, you've got the unique perspective of having gone and covered one of the biggest stories of the year with the Russian invasion in Ukraine. And then we spent probably, what, a few months over there? About four and four yeah. this year. And then you've come back and seen the effects of it here, whether it be gas prices or the support for Ukraine. What's that been like? Um, it's, it's definitely been a, a unique perspective for me, especially, um, you know, I spent years reporting overseas, but I was usually based there, and um, I, my, my trips home would be much more infrequent, and to kind of go, come and go um, throughout this calendar year, and in the in earliest days, seeing sort of the overwhelming support, and, you know, I don't know how it is here, but certainly in D.C. and up in New York, around the East Coast, you see the Ukrainian flag everywhere, and it was... Um, really impressive and touching to see that, especially having seen the people suffering there and what they're going through. Um, and obviously, there's still a lot of support. You know, people talk to me, ask me what it's like, and they're very um, compassionate about what's happening there. But they're, the demands of their pocketbooks and their demands of their daily lives um, obviously, uh, uh, you know, kind of take take precedent uh, over over what's happening so far away. And this is something that lawmakers are, are, are recognizing. And so what was sort of this overwhelming bipartisan support that we were seeing throughout, it still exists, but there are starting to be cracks in that. Um, when I come back er after every trip, I, you know, I get my lawmakers and their staffers, you know, reaching out to me saying, we want to talk to you, we want to hear what's going on over there. You know, they really value our perspective, especially that we get to the front lines where a lot they can't, you know. And, um, and what was supposed to be, what do they need, what can we do to help, was more of them reaching out to me to say, um, we're losing support in the House, and we fear that if the um, Democrats lose the House, we're going. To, it's going to be a lot harder to get Ukraine the help that they need. And we see this now in the last couple of weeks um, with a rush of um, sending aid to Ukraine that the administration has been kind of pushing out this aid. You know, at the end of the day, there are some lawmakers, and they're probably still in the minority, but we'll see what happens after the midterms. There are lawmakers that say, listen, it's really hard for me to go back and talk to my constituents who can't afford gas, who can't afford groceries, and tell them we're sending billions and billions of dollars to Ukraine. It's important to understand that the pot of money where that money from you for Ukraine goes is very different from the pot of money for any kind of economic stimulus, but a lot of voters don't understand that is what the lawmakers tell me. And so they're struggling to get out there and tell people where they say, how are you giving billions of dollars to Ukraine? And I can't put groceries on the table because the prices are so high. And so that's been a really interesting um, aspect for me and definitely something that I see playing out, you know, um, all over the country. I have the advantage of covering both politics and national security. And so it's very interesting to see that di dynamic at play. And I'm sure it's going to get even more heated up um, once we're through the midterms. What's it like in Ukraine? Uh. Um, it's a struggle. It's it's going to be a, sl a long slog in Ukraine. Um, obviously, you've heard, probably seen the headlines about um, annexation of territory. Um, the U.S. has called it a sham. They're not going to recognize it. None of its allies are going to recognize it. But at the end of the day, Russia still controls about a third of Ukraine. Uh, and even though they, uh, the Ukrainians are making gains, they're making they're modest gains so far. Um, those gains would not have happened without U.S. support. Obviously, the Ukrainians are the ones on the front line. They are very, very passionate and dedicated. They're fighting for their own territory, their own land. But it's it's a struggle, and um, mo momentum uh, with regard to allies' support is going to be key. Um, if the U.S. or its other allies start to wane in support, I think the Ukrainians are really going to struggle moving forward, and it's a really long battle ahead. Can I ask a follow-up? Please. <laughs> um, so you mentioned the congressional fracturing of support policy. What about the international coalition? Like that, uh, obviously, President Biden has worked so hard to keep the West all aligned, but do you see that coalition starting to fracture? I mean, the, inter the, the, the way that the Biden administration approached and formed this international coalition was pretty extraordinary. And a lot of the Biden administration's critics will tell you, well, the Afghanistan withdrawal was so such a disaster, essentially, that they had to do this. But also, they, they, they really had the um, intelligence. They declassified things early. They formed a coalition. They went after Putin early on and exposed it. I think what you're seeing is there is concern that the Americans support in Washington is starting to wane uh, 
long before any of the other allies. And the allies, keep in mind, you know, a lot of this is happening essentially in their backyard. And so for them, it is, an, it is a threat that, that, that essentially uh, is existential for them because if Putin can go and invade the sovereignty of one country, uh, you know, who's to say they can't spill into Poland or, you know, Romania the next day and the next day after that, you know, keep on going toward Germany and France and whatever. And so for them, it's a very, very real threat. We here in the United States are far removed from it. And, and this is the, the hard selling point for a lot of people here who just say, well, you know, we feel for them, but they're so far away. Alice, you're covering an entirely different beast with city hall politics. What's your day-to-day -day life like, and how are, how many aldermen are you tracking down on a daily basis? <laughs> yeah, um, Chicago definitely has a lot of aldermen, 50 of them. <laughs> um, yeah, my day-to-day -day kind of varies. Um, I, you know, first started covering politics in literally March 2020, so it was very different landscape. I don't know if I've had a normal day since. But um, a lot of it is, like, following like politician schedules, following budget meetings, people on the campaign trail. Um, and you kind of hear them say the same things over and over, but it's really taking stock of, you know, trends you're seeing, um, like common threads you can make stories with. So yeah, a lot of my um, time isn't necessarily chasing, uh, writing a brief every single day of every development, but I kind of keep a running Google Doc of um, every time I like witness an event and try to like take down all the details that I know I'm gonna forget in a few weeks. Um, a lot of it is also FOIA. Um, you're not going to get um, a huge chunk of the stories you need to get unless you file FOIA. So, can you talk um, about what a FOIA is for us? Oh yeah, who are Freedom still of learning? Information Act. Um, so yeah, basically, if you need to request um, records from government, and that can include um, like docu like budget documents, or it can include literally emails or text messages of the mayor. Um, you write out a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, you file it. You give them five business days. They usually will ask for an extension. Sometimes they'll blow the deadline, and you'll have to talk to your editor and maybe your lawyer. Um, so it's it's a whole like different logistical nightmare that <laughs> you might not expect um, like first starting out in journalism, but it's a pretty critical part to holding government officials accountable. I would say. What are some of the big issues you're covering right now at City Hall? Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously there's a mayor's race um, going on in February, and you know, right now it's still a bit too early to tell how the race is going to shape out. But um, I would say, you know, Chicago, um, the mood there is kind of despondent. We've had a tough four years, and a lot of people are kind of looking for change. Um, I don't really subscribe that much to the polling done locally, but, you know, it does say that the mayor has low, um, lower than usual approval ratings. Um, so, yeah, I guess this election, kind of more than others, would be a referendum on what future direction Chicago wants to go in. Do, do, does the progressive ticket that, you know, ha, kind of has momentum after the devastation from COVID and um, the racial reckoning in Chicago, um, it, are they gonna keep that momentum going and finally elect one of their own? Cause that's what they've been trying to do for election after election. Or is the backlash to the rise in crime since 2019, um, and especially 20, in 2020, is that gonna um, get a more conservative candidate who wants to cr be tough on crime and you know strengthen the police department, or you know is Lightfoot who's sort of in the middle but um, you know um, tr kind of tries to like play all sides, um, is she gonna appease the most people? It's it remains to be seen. Um, we had some dramatic testimony from the January 6th commission today, and I think we've had you all working with students all day, but I think you might have seen the most of it of all of us. Can you talk to us about the vote um, to subpoena Donald Trump? Sure. So. You know, the House Select Committee on January 6th has um, produced probably, I would say, of all the congressional hearings I've ever covered, uh, sort of made-for-TV congressional hearings. Uh, in fact, they hired the former president of ABC News to come in and be a consultant to put it together. And with each one of their hearings, they try to sort of end it with a cliffhanger or a bombshell of a development. And Today was their last, or what we believe will be their last public hearing uh, before their report comes out at the end of the year. And um, they ended it with a vote in committee uh, to subpoena Donald Trump to testify, to provide documents. Of course, there's zero expectation that Donald Trump is going to uh, comply with that. Uh, the subpoena hasn't even been issued yet. It was just uh, the vote. But I think the other... Um, big development uh, today beyond uh, that symbolic vote. Uh, and I just say we don't expect that because, you know, they subpoenaed Steve Bannon and Mark Meadows and others who have refused to testify. And so uh, it seems uh, pretty assured that, that Donald Trump will, will do so as well. Um, 
but they also released new, never before seen video footage. Uh, and I don't know if you've, anybody here has had a chance to see this today, it was unbelievable stuff, that um, Speaker Pelosi's daughter, Alexandra Pelosi, who's a documentary filmmaker, was with the speaker on January 6th. She was with her mom, and um, when they, when all the congressional leadership uh, went to what was then an undisclosed location uh, for security purposes while the Capitol was under siege, uh, Alexandra Pelosi was there with her camera and was uh, filming it. And you see uh, Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, and Speaker Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, um, Kevin McCarthy, you, you see the congressional leadership scrambling to deal with the fact that their Congress was uh, under attack. Uh, th they had left the rank and file membership behind and they were getting messages about real concerns about security, obviously, and this is all unfolding and you see them scrambling to get on the phone and have a conversation with the acting Secretary of Defense or uh, the acting Attorney General at the time and uh, trying any which way, pleading for help, you see Pelosi on the phone with the governor of Virginia, uh, asking to get the National Guard activated, and it and it, it's just such a stark contrast from all the testimony that provided about Donald Trump and his actions or inactions in those hours back at the White House that the committee had sort of put forth uh, throughout the summer in their hearings, which that contrast, no doubt, was their intended uh, uh, purpose here, but it really, you know, we don't get to see, I mean, that was like history unfolding before our eyes that we got to see today in footage that we had never seen before. So I think that'll probably be sort of the lasting uh, impact in terms of public impression from today's hearing. But Domenico, is this playing at all in the midterm elections? Are you sensing that this is something that voters are going to the polls on? You know, there's a, no, first of all. But uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the good uh, answer. there's an irony Simple. to this, though, because, um, Earlier in the summer, it looked like, to a degree, Trump's ironclad grip on the Republican Party seemed to be loosening slightly. Uh, that you started to hear more conversation about Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, and how he's a more disciplined, less chaotic version of Trump who could fight the culture wars but not you know, step in it necessarily. Um, and then ironically, the Mar-a-Lago search seemed to you know, strengthen that grip uh, because people, partisanship is so uh, hyper right now that, uh, you know, you put the t-shirt on and it's really hard to take it off. You know, people are, are fighting with each other on social media. I think there was a report out that showed how social media has not only, um, you know, lent itself to polarization, but toward deepening polarization because people are just, um, you know, willing to fight you know, they're just, they're just, uh, they, they need to back that up. And I think that idea of confirmation bias, the idea that something I believe is what I believe, and there's a source out there to tell me it's true, uh, is kind of one of the biggest problems we have because people are far less likely to unravel things once they get, on, get put that t-shirt on and get down that rabbit hole. Um, you know, what we saw in our polling is that the people who are, and other polls have shown this too, the people who are mostly watching these hearings are Democrats. The people who are mostly paying attention to them are Democrats. You did have a, a, you know, a percentage of independents, the very slim, you know, shrinking number of people in this country who are persuadable, who were somewhat paying attention, but not uh, as much as Democrats were, and Republicans is not paying attention at all. And, you know, I mean, when you have people who are, used to work for Trump, you know, all coming forward to say what they were saying, it was a bit surprising that it didn't make more of a dent, but then again, I'm not surprised really by anything in politics right now. Anymore. The one, one item that I would just add to what Domenico said, which I totally subscribe to, and I don't think you'll find many voters voting on the, the events of January 6th or what the committee is doing, um, but consistently we've seen in polling that um, election integrity and voting issues is a important issue for voters, and by the way, for majorities of Republicans and Democrats on, on that issue because they see those issues from two very different sides. But it's an important issue uh, to both sides for their, uh, for their perspective. And it, it's not as uh, high of mind as the economy, of course, but I have been surprised it, how consistently we see that issue of uh, election integrity, voting rights, what have you, uh, 
uh, strike as high as it does on voters' minds, and um, that clearly is tied to everything surrounding the January 6th insurrection. But like you said, from two different angles. Yeah, I mean, totally. Republicans who are saying that are saying that because they think the election was stolen. Yeah. You know, it's a little different. They do see a threat to democracy, and the threats they see are totally different. Um, Vivian, Domenico mentioned Mar-a-Lago, and you came back from Ukraine recently and were on that team that broke a lot of the Mar-a-Lago stories. You've also been in the room with Donald Trump more than anybody here, I'm guessing. What was that like covering Donald Trump and still covering him, even on a national security beat like this? The news gift that uh, keeps on giving. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, was, it was tiring in a lot of ways. So we, we had, um, it, it, was a, it was a fascinating experience. He is the first president that I ever covered because I was. Uh, They're all you know, like that. Uh, they're all like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I am sure. Yeah, the, I, in the earliest days, I used to turn to my colleagues and I'd be like, "Is this normal?" And they're like, "Not really." <laughs> you know, um, I, I, it was all very new for me. It was very interesting because of the way, especially that he used Twitter in the earliest days. Obviously, um, that changed in the end. But um, he, the president says something on Twitter, and it was official. It was an official presidential statement. It was something that was going to go into the National Archives, and we had to take it very seriously, and we were being very reactive to um, covering anything that he said. And after a while, you know, we had to kind of develop this discipline of sort of questioning, you know, do we take a step back? Do we question it? Is, this doesn't seem factually accurate. Should we go to the White House before we publish anything? And it was always this like evolving conversation of how do you cover this president who is very unorthodox in the way he A, uses social media, B, just, you know, kind of operates in the day to day. And so um, that was one of the most interesting things. It was an evolution for all of us. I mean, you know, by the time we got to like the Cafe Fe tweets and things like that, you know, we were obviously able to be like, well, I don't think we need to, you know, do anything on this and stuff like that where, I mean, but even just, you know, his like back and forth, you know, um, attacks of, on, different world leaders. I mean, sometimes he would say things about um, the French President Macron or like the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. And, um, you know, every now and then it'd be rooted in some sort of policy issue, but other times it was just because he was really annoyed with them for something really random. And so, you know, we would try to kind of uh, at least go to the White House and say, what, what is the president trying to say here? And, 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 and find some policy within that. And so that was that. I mean, he, he kept us on our toes. There were a lot of late nights uh, weekends, holidays, um, you know, I remember the, he randomly fired the um, Homeland Security Secretary on like a late, late on a Saturday night in a tweet, and, uh, you know, we were working all night and things like that, where it was, uh, you know, those kinds of things don't necessarily happen with this administration, but um, this administration has kept us very busy on the policy side of things, too. I mean, a lot has happened in that regard, so that's the biggest difference there. Uh, what? We, Sorry. I was just going to say, we focused a lot, there was a lot of focus also on, like, staff and um, internal kind of uh, uh, palace intrigue, for lack of a better word, um, because of the fact that they, it was such a different, unorthodox, unique group um, that, was, that was running the country. And so we had to, you know, we, they, they also became part of the story. What's the level of access like based on who the president is um, that you're covering or what news outlet you're working for? So it's, or, it's the, actually, or the level of complaints you're receiving? It's actually funny, and, I, and I've said this um, publicly a lot, um, especially since those days um, came to an end, is the thing about Donald Trump is that despite the fact that publicly he was um, criticizing uh, the media at large, and maybe a particular news organization that might be on this panel in particular, um, uh, you know, behind the scenes, he never wanted us to leave the room. He always wanted us there. He would tell his staff to keep us in the room. He, he, we were existential for him. Like, he believed that having us there documenting the every moment, I mean, we, we, we would say, you would hear it called a reality television show, and he loved that, um, that image. He wanted us there to see everything. His, his staff didn't. <laughs> they wanted us out of the room because God only knows, you know, what he would say sometimes. They felt like it would just cause more problems or, or controversies or whatever. And the interesting thing is that this administration, despite the fact that they really go out publicly and tout um, free press and the fourth estate and just the importance of, a, uh, of, 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 of media in this country, access tends to be a problem. 
Um, and this is something that we deal with constantly with the current White House, and we're always raising this issue, um, both the White House um, Correspondents Association, but also media, our media organizations individually and as a group, constantly pressing them for more access. And so it's an interesting dynamic to, on the one hand, be criticized publicly, which can cause a lot of problems and creates a lot of tension and a lot of animosity toward the media. And we saw it at his rallies and all these other things where sometimes it would be a little bit dangerous. But on the other hand, he also believed that having us in the room at all times was important for him as a, as a politician, as an individual. And so it was that dynamic versus the dynamic of, okay, like you, you talk about free press, but then you don't wanna give us access. Um, and so we, it's, it's a constant struggle on both sides of it. Alice, you've covered the Obama Presidential Center. I bet that might not have been quite as exciting as being stuck in a room with Donald Trump. What was that like? Um, yeah, I think covering the Obama Presidential Center, like obviously that was, you know, a, a big like a, like a national story. But it also taught me a lot about local journalism. Um, I think the best stories I got were just get, getting out on the ground on the South Side neighborhood that um, you know d was directly adjacent to the center, talking to neighbors about their concerns with the center because not everyone was happy with it. We had the parks people who felt that it was not fair to give free parkland, you know, to a former president to build a museum um, in his honor. Um, we had neighbors who were really worried about gentrification. Um, and you know we are seeing evidence of that in that neighborhood that you know home prices are going up. Um, there's people like leaving, and um, it was actually a pretty um, poignant story about activism because a lot of the neighbors banded together. They um, you know protested you know every like month until the they got the city to pass um, an ordinance that would you know protect some of the rent, add some perks for homeowners who um, are already there, and it kind of uh, was a good like way for me to witness um, how to cover like a story of activism um, while also you know, covering the mechanics of the um, library coming. Um, Domenico, let's talk about the next three weeks for you. What races are you watching? What should people in the room here um, be reading and following and thinking about? All of them. No, I mean, <laughs> if you had to boil it down. Yeah, well, if you have to boil it down, there's probably five Senate races that everyone's paying attention to. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, and what's the fifth? Uh, uh, New Hampshire, I guess. Yes. Um, I think so. Maybe. Pick your pick your. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Pick your New fifth. Hampshire. Yeah, there's like ten total, but uh, there's there's five or so, and they're all really close. I mean, they're really close races. You know, if, if Democrats pick up Pennsylvania, which right now you know the campaigns think is possible, although I'll be really interested to see how John Fetterman, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, performs in the October 25th debate that they have. I think it's gonna be kind of an important uh, time for him uh, after his stroke that he'd had and uh, how he sort of deals with uh, with that on stage and having to you know, explain it to voters and how he operates now with the auditory processing issues and stuff. It's really interesting, I think, just overall um, to see how that plays out. Um, but if Democrats do pick up Pennsylvania, Republicans will need to net two more seats to be able to take control of the Senate. And there are a host of reasons why that's possible and why it might not happen. I mean, Georgia, obviously, all the issues with Herschel Walker have been talked about. Um, you know, Arizona, Mark Kelly has held up fairly well, uh, the Democrat there. But that's a state that Democrats have been saying for a while is one that they're a little concerned about because it's a state where there's more Republicans than there are. Democrats, uh, that it's a state that always closes and tightens. And Nevada, frankly, Catherine Cortez Masto has been the, Demo been the Democrat that Republicans have been telling me for a year has been the most vulnerable Democratic incumbent. And there's a real story there to do or to, uh, that we're doing, but that to watch is about Latinos in the state and how you know, they're, they're, they're a very strong working class population in Nevada, very much affected by the economy. It's a high white, white working class population, a fairly significant Asian American population that have trended toward Democrats and have helped Democrats win. And people sort of think of Nevada as a blue state. But really, if you look at the elections Democrats have won, they've been very close, two points or so. Harry Reid, the longtime, uh, you know, Senate Democrat, you know, died, and his machine, quote unquote, is what sort of used to turn out a lot of voters with the culinary union and all that. And Republicans have been saying for a while, the culinary union's upset with Democrats because of the COVID lockdowns. And they, they're not sure that they're gonna vote Republican, but they think that they may not be as enthusiastic 
as they have been in previous years to vote Democrat. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be a really interesting dynamic because Republicans have this um, effort called Operation Vamos, where they have um, uh, in nine states they're appealing to uh, Latinos about on the economy and trying to win them over on that and on crime. And they're doing it in places that you wouldn't necessarily expect it, like Wisconsin, which actually has like 8% population of Latinos, and Ron Johnson needs every vote he can get, and he's he's working those communities. So I think it's gonna be some interesting reshaping of uh, our politics that happens, and some interesting analyses that are gonna happen after that, and some interesting congressional races, but we can't get into all of them, so. <laughs> um, David, you run a polling desk. How would you advise our student journalists to understand and trust polls and for their reporting? Um, yeah, it's it's, it's best really to not have your coverage driven by polling. I think polling is an element that can inform your thinking about it, but I, but I think co coverage that is driven by polling is sort of missing um, the story. And, and I'm a poll addict, I love polls, but like it, 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 uh, it is always, uh, we always get in our own way when we allow just the polling to drive what uh, we're covering, but there, First of all, polling is, there's a range of polling out there. There's some terrible polls that just have no idea what they're doing methodologically, and there's some very sound polling. And what we saw in 2016, and then actually even worse in 2020, but nobody realizes that because um, the election went the way that the sort of polls suggested, but the, the, the polling industry is trying to really dig in and find like what is it that uh, methodologically is happening that they are missing some people uh, to that are not being reflected in the polls, namely Trump supporters uh, in, in uh, large part in the last couple of elections. So I always think the way to approach polling is to look at the totality of it. Don't focus in on one poll, don't focus in on like one number or the margin, like this person's up two points or down two points. That's all, that's all the same thing. Like if, if somebody is, up two points, and another poll shows them down two points, those two polls are telling the same story, which is, this is a close race with no clear leader, and it can go either way. That's the takeaway from that. I think um, beyond the horse race, polling can be helpful to give us insight into sort of how we are ideologically sorting ourselves in the country, uh, where people are uh, putting their, what, what they say, the issues that are driving their vote. and. There's another piece to this, which is not the polling itself, but how we report on polls. And I, I think that that causes as much um, negative public perception about polling as does actual polling errors. And that is, so what I just described to you, I'll give you an example. Uh, we at CNN, if a poll has two candidates that are within the margin of error of the poll, Nothing in our copy on our banners on the bottom of the screen or in the graphic can describe one candidate leading the other. We have a big yellow uh, highlighted banner across the graphic that says no clear leader. Like, so it's incumbent upon us who report on polls to convey the lack of precision that polls are designed to do. It is, it is a, it's more a broad brush kind of tool. It's not a precision instrument. And so the more we can convey to the audience don't just focus in on this number, but take in the totality of sort of the picture that this survey data, which is high quality, is giving us about where the electorate is. That's, that's how I use polling and try to convey uh, polling to the viewers and the audience. I mean, it's really good for sentiment and for trends. I mean, I think it's important to look at polls over time and see if things are headed in what direction. I like to say, you know, when it comes to specific issue research, for example, uh, you know, same-sex marriage, for example, or marijuana legalization, we wouldn't know how quickly the country has shifted its view on those subjects without good, rigorous uh, survey research that's conducted well. The problem, I think Dave is right, is that like, there's a lot of stuff that's not great, and then the way it gets reported sometimes uh, makes it all seem like the same thing, and people just pay attention to the highlights of the horse race of who's up and who's down, as opposed to digging in a little bit further on uh, the attitudinal shifts. I think the attitudinal shifts in the country inform our politics, and they're really important to look at and use. But I mean, I agree. I mean, I, I use it as like a 
it's out there as a thing, but you know, it's more of a jumping off point to ask questions of campaigns. Can I ask these guys a question? Please. <laughs> I, I'm just kind of curious what, what you guys think about um, how much the polls drive people to either vote or not to vote because mm. they see the polls coming out and they say, well, my candidate is going to lose anywhere, my candidate is going to win anyway, so I don't have to go. So that's a, uh, something you hear that uh, people bring up and, and talk about that. I don't think that the research that has been done on that phenomenon actually backs it up. I, I, I don't think it's been uh, an actually sort of scientifically proven theory uh, that, that polls uh, drive it. Now, obviously, it has some impact. I'm not suggesting that there's none, but I don't think, I don't think we see just the mere reporting of polls or that your candidate may be up or down. I don't think we've seen a ton of evidence that it actually determines how people decide to show up or vote or not. Alex, you were talking today about how you are trying not to do minuscule developments in city hall politics. You're covering big themes, kind of similarly to the polls. Watch the trends. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so I think it, I think it just requires a lot of good beat reporting. Um, you have to show up to as many things as you can. You have to show up um, every day and kind of like take stock of all the little things, like oh, how is this crowd reacting to this candidate? Um, what is like what themes are like getting this person the most riled up. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of that. Um, it's also just a lot of trying to like meet different characters and thinking who can drive a story. Um, like for example, I wanted to do a story on the rise of Asian Americans in Illinois politics, but I didn't just want to write like X candidates are running. This is like, I don't know, novel or whatever. So I ended up like talking around like my sources um, until I met this one guy who owned a printing business in like China, near Chinatown. Um, he kind of was the person who printed like campaign material for all the candidates. And he mostly um, started just working with um, uh, black candidates who had less money on hand. And then he started um, meeting um, Asian politicians who were just getting their leg up. And he kind of was like a great way to like start that story and to, uh, talk about this little slice of life like near Chinatown and where all these candidates came and went um, and got their footing started. Um, and I think just getting to do like those little things where it kind of tells a bigger story, but you're really focusing really um, narrowly, um, kind of does the most reporting, um, rewarding stories. I've got one last question for Vivian, and then we'd love to hear questions from all of you in the audience. Um, but Vivian, I'm just thinking, we've seen North Korea testing missiles in the past week. Uh, we've got Putin collaborating with Saudi Arabia. What's the biggest story we don't know about right now that we should be thinking about? in terms of the foreign lens to what's going on right now? Oh, gosh. Um, so something, I, it's, I think you actually hit on the two biggest ones, but I, I will throw in two more. Um, Iran is going to continue to be a big story as far as its own um, any any breakthroughs with this Iran nuclear deal um, that the Biden administration is trying to achieve, although the whole entire thing is on life support. Um, and then something that I just, it's fresh in my mind because I just returned with the Secretary of State. We were in Latin America last week. We went to three different countries. Um, Latin America, if, if the Brazilian elections are going on right now and uh, a, left, a leftist president may be re-elected, he used to be president, he might come back. Um, if that happens, then every single major Latin American country will have a, hard, a far left leader um, and it's going to pose a lot of challenges for U.S. foreign policy in Latin America. And obviously, you guys know immigration is a hot topic. There are a lot of other um, issues, cooperation on drugs, everything like that. It's going to be a really big deal. Unfortunately, that um, tends to fall through the cracks in terms of our daily kind of news discourse. But it's going to be a really hot topic. So kind of keep an eye on Latin America. Do we have any questions from the audience? I just had a question. Yes.
Um, well, for I, everyone on Zoom who's on the webinar version, that question was about coverage of independence, just to boil it down. Yeah, I mean, I think independents are the most important, you know, voting block that exists. I mean, and I think that their shift in party ID trends, where we've seen an increase in number of independents overall nationally, um, you know, a lot of them coming from the Republican Party and sort of bleeding over, um, I think is, is notable and something that I think is really important, and I've tried to cover quite a bit of, and a state like Nevada, um, not Nevada, a state like Arizona, which is really key, independents are super key, which is why Kirsten Cinema, for example, when she ran her first ad in, uh, for her uh, re-election campaign, she was like, Kirsten Cinema, independent, right? She doesn't wanna say Democrat, right? She's trying to appeal to that group, a place like New Hampshire, which is like more than 40% independent uh, is really important. I mean, Democrats and Republicans are kind of boring. They just vote the same way all the time, right? So that's, that's like the least, um, you, know, in, uh, you know, enthusiastic I am about covering a group is about just covering Democrats and Republicans, certainly. Uh, the, the problem is uh, when it comes to which candidates people have to vote for, we really have only two, you know, parties that are major party candidates that people then have to make a choice about who they're gonna vote for. So that's why I think you wind up hearing a lot about the Democrat and the Republican because there's no magic middle in this country where people agree on everything. Those independents have some uh, wide variety of issues that they care about, you know? And just like we were talking about democracy, the threats to democracy and how some people on the right, you know, think there's a threat to democracy in a very different way that um, Democrats do, um, or people on the left. Yeah, I think independents are a huge key to, uh, to uh, electoral politics. Okay. Who else? Yeah. Did we? Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one thing that's been interesting to watch for you is uh, the McCain balance and how much that really changed from uh, 2018 to 2019, not 2022. Uh, I got involved in the Jimmy Pritchard campaign, some of you might know about him. He was the alpha male candidate. How is mail-in balance changing How is mail-in voting changing? Um, so uh, we've seen a long-term trend in the country over the last several decades um, of an increase in mail balloting. We've seen some states early on, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, went sort of all mail ballot. California has uh, joined uh, in that in a large way, Arizona. So a lot of Western states really started uh, the, the American trend to this, uh, it is, you know, the, so it, it's been on the rise. The pandemic put it on steroids, obviously, so it became how most people in the country were voting during the pandemic. Uh, and what we saw is that, uh, again, largely because of the way President Trump um, decided to politicize it and, and th thought he would see, he thought he saw political advantage for himself in sort of uh, trying to diminish mail balloting um, until, I mean, so much so that some of his campaign aides were like, boss, this is how people are actually voting and we need their votes, so we need you to not be so down on mail ballots, especially in certain states. Uh, they had to get him to sort of uh, soften that message a little bit, uh, which, as you can all see, he didn't do so much of. But the, um, I think what we anticipate will happen 
now is that I don't think we're going to see the level of mail balloting that we saw in 2020 in 2022, but I think we'll see it more than it was in 2018. So I think it'll be somewhere sort of in the middle uh, of that or uh, what have you. We'll see some... Um, We'll see some shift back to more people are going to vote in person on election day, uh, so it won't be quite as dramatic a difference. But we still see in all the, um, this isn't just polling, this is actually now in people, you know, election day is happening every day right now, folks. I, I know we count the votes in 26 days, but there are lots and lots of Americans who are voting now early. And we see in the mail ballots requested and the mail ballots returned, we still see Democrats are voting that way in much greater numbers than our Republicans. So the partisanship split will still be there with the method of voting, which is something to keep in mind when you're watching the election returns come in on election night. Uh, you know, it may present a, a, a bit of a mirage where, where if the mail ballots are counted first, it may look that that district or state uh, looks a lot more democratic than it will be when all the votes are in because if the election day vote is being counted and reported second, that'll be the bulk of the Republican vote coming in. So just keep that in mind as you're as you're watching the returns come in on November 8th. I also think the politicization of, of mail-in ballots and all of that has created a real disparity in ballot access across the country depending on who's running your state. You know, if you're in a democratic state, it's sort of like all options go, longer early voting times, uh, mail-in is okay. And in Republican states, they're curtailing that and scaling that back. So uh, and there's real issues with that um, from, a, from a diversity standpoint of who's going to the polls, of who's able to vote. Uh, there's some real uh, concerns there for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I know NPR, we've had an effort to actually have our um, our uh, stories on the web actually be bilingual, so you can actually read in Spanish and in English. Um, I find it interesting as a reporter to go watch you know, Univision or Telemundo to see what things actually people care about uh, in the Latino community because it's not always about immigration, which I think has been a huge problem for the Democratic Party in addressing Latinos as strictly caring about immigration. And you know that can be a threshold issue, but there's a lot more nuance to it, and the Latino community is not um, you know, a monolith, and there are a lot of different groups coming from a lot of different places. Um, and it's, uh, I, 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 think it's, I think there is a huge disconnect between a very, uh, from the largest growing group in the country and traditionally, you know, white dominated media that you don't see, uh, that there's a real disconnect in understanding uh, that I think is there's gonna have to be a reckoning with because, uh, you know, Latinos are only gonna keep growing as uh, one of the largest uh, groups in the country. Vivian's nodding here. Do you have anything to add? Oh, no, I mean, I, I absolutely agree, and I think that, like, the biggest point that I would agree with especially is that, that you know, immigration, while it is a threshold issue, obviously, you know, the price of goods and, you know, gas prices and all those things are obviously mean a lot, too, um, but it's it's outreach, and it's about access, and, like, I, you know, I think I think that the media definitely, I, I think technology is, is making it more accessible um, and, and breaking those language barriers in a lot of ways, but, um, you know, obviously, it's, it's a work in progress, so. Go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here and uh, it's my first year so thank you and you know, all my relatives and friends and family who come back here. Uh, so it's uh, it's interesting to have an insight into the US politics. Uh, so my question is definitely uh, non US centric uh, apart from the politics but uh, internal politics as well. So I wanted to ask uh, I just wanted to know over the last decade since the US adopted self government. 
QRP formation. Now on the back of the last demonstrated site, the first element that we have on the CPU is very careful not to do that at all. So my question is, uh, what do you think if there is, uh, um, how much of an issue there is on behalf of the political establishment if at all to educate the American public about what is the uh, real time dangers affecting their lives of reporting uh, military action? Um, uh, so, so you're you're wondering about whether the U.S. Just so, so I'm understanding correctly, you're wondering uh, if U.S. voters have a say or like influence military decisions. Did I understand that correctly? Sorry. Oh, I mean, I think I think that the the U.S. has been very vocal about sort of the role of the military of defending U.S. freedoms and security and things like that, and um, that has been definitely something that um, that has been a justification for some of our overseas wars in the last 20 years, and especially because we had attacks here on our home soil 20 years ago. So I think a lot of people sort of understood that and appreciated that. But obviously, the further away we got from that, the harder it was to justify when it was so far away from their daily lives and soldiers were going out there and dying. Um, it, it, it became a little bit harder to, to, to do that. And so I think that's why you've had several consecutive presidents now wanting to scale back on US presence abroad, um, and why President Biden took the very controversial decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan is like, at the end of the day, he said, it's going to hurt. It's like ripping off a Band-Aid, but, you know, we cannot fight these forever wars. Um, you know, it, the military can also do really good things domestically as far as just, you know, securing the homeland. And so um, I think it's an evolving conversation constantly, just depending on what our national security priorities are. Um, and educating voters and educating the public about that is obviously also a work in progress, but I think that's where we stand today. One more, Analika. Challenges that we face covering this, covering the crisis, getting there, you know, experiencing things, interacting with people in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The airport is not open, and I have spent more time in a car this year than I'd <laughs> than ever in my life. Um, Ukraine is large, and it, it takes um, a good. I mean, from from the west to the east, it will take you. Um, about 17, 18 hours to cross the country from east, uh, from west to east. Um, so we usually, most of us will go in um, via Poland by land. We'll cross on foot. Um, most of us will do that. And, uh, and then we'll get picked up on the Ukrainian side and we will drive to wherever we have to go. Obviously, logistically, that's, it's. Who picks you up? Um, so we have security teams who work with us. Um, not every journalist is that lucky, but the major news organizations will usually provide security, uh, security detail for the r reporters. And so when I'm in Ukraine, um, and this used to be the case when I was based, I was Baghdad bureau chief for the AP bef um, until 2016 when ISIS was taking over the country. We would usually roll as like a reporter, a security guy, or maybe two. Um, a fixer slash translator if you don't speak the language. In, in Ukraine, I did not, so I had a fixer translator and a photographer. Um, you know, the TV crews tend to go in larger entourages, but they also have that, that kind of setup. Um, and so, it, you know, we, we would get picked up by the security guys and then sort of hit the road. Um, I'd, we'd usually go to Kyiv. You saw some pictures in the intro. I was interviewing the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. I'd usually check in with people in Kyiv, which is the capital, and then I'd head out to the front lines from there. And so the front lines obviously are very dangerous. Um, Where do you, you know, stay at night? 
it just depends on where you are. I mean, that's not a hotel, know. right? Uh, it, no, it? no, we, we were staying in hotels. Um, it was very selective as far as which hotels. Obviously, um, the closer we got to the front line, um, the, the heavier the bombardments were. We didn't want to get a, a hotel that was perceived as a target, and so our security guys would usually make that um, assessment for us. Um, but, you know, I could tell you for a fact there's an area in the south called Nikolaev. There's also an area in the east called Kharkiv, which is right near the um, Russian border. I've spent a lot of time there in July and August, and, and we were getting woken up multiple times a night by explosions. Um, and it's just kind of the way of life if you're getting the closer you are to those front lines. Um, I will also say that Ukraine is a very different war. I've probably covered wars in five or six countries now. And Ukraine is a very different war from any other that I've covered. Um, you hear about it probably over and over again in the news, at, at described as an art artillery war. And just so you understand what that means, it means that you're firing missiles at long range. Um, we haven't seen a war like this since World War I, um, maybe World War II, um, because of the fact that you're dealing with these huge fields. I mean, Ukraine is stunning. Sunflower fields and wheat fields and watermelon fields. But because of the fact that it's all this open space, there's not a lot of places to hide. And so that's why the US has been sending these long range missiles, because you're having to fire at long distances. Um, and that's a very strange feeling. I could tell you in Iraq, we would see ISIS fighters and literally wave at them and they would give us the finger and curse us off and we can hear them cursing us off. You know, it, we were that close to them and they would be firing guns mostly. These guys are firing these huge missiles and it's a very scary thing when you don't see your adversary, you don't know where their missile is coming from and it also makes it a very slow war as a, as a result of that. Um, and so that's kind of the biggest challenge of, of covering a war there. It's a little bit scary when you're on a front line and you, a missile can hit at any moment and you really don't have that much notice. So, um, you know, I feel for those guys who are on the front line. It's, it's really difficult. Good question. Um, David Chalian, Vivian Salama, Allison, Domenico Montanaro, thank you all for being here thank tonight. You. We're so lucky to have you. Thank you, Rich and Leslie. Thank you for coming. Have a good night.